I'm Tony Anagor, and joining us today is a visionary leader who is reshaping the startup landscape from within. Please welcome my dear friend, Sebastian Ross. So Sebastian, people would describe you as um, a visionary, um, a maverick. Um, Everybody would describe you as just an all-round authentic great guy. How would you describe yourself? (laughs) Wow. (laughs) I should have asked for the question before. What comes to mind is um, not a great answer to your question, but is I I often inside still feel like a little boy exploring the world. Mm. I know I'm 55, I have gray hair, little hair left, and people who see me see a 55-year-old guy, but inside of me, I feel like nothing, not much has changed over the last 30, 40 years. I, I can be as, yeah, just a little guy trying to explore, <laughs> understand this world, explore it, and establish himself mm. himself in it. You know? And then over time, that's that's part of my my, my story and part of my my answer. You know? But um, then over the years, um I think I've shaped my identity uh, to a certain d- degree. You know? I think in, in, in earlier phases of my life, I was trying to a higher degree to adopt what I think was expected of me. You know, it can be family, it can be the first jobs, it can be a circle of friends, it can be certain associations that I be- belong to. Um, but all those years, I I understand better what I what's really me, what I stand for, what are my, my values, my, my, my convictions. And, and I'm trying to express them, make them <clears throat> visible, you know, uh, let people know what I, mm. or what I, what I, what I stand for. You know? And if your question is probably what, what, what is that exactly? Um, mm. I think I'm somehow trying to trying to serve, trying to be useful, trying to impact the people around me hmm. in a positive in, in, in a positive in a positive way, and I I do that with you know, the knowledge and tools that I've accumulated over those years. Um, hmm. But that gives purpose to my life sense um, and happiness, essentially, also. Um, I was far more selfish when, when I was younger. It's a little bit of a natural mat- maturation process, I think. Um, but over the years, I, I kind of just discovered that happy doesn't, doesn't necessarily come from you achieving all your objectives, your material objectives, but rather being being a good person and trying to be useful to others and nice to others and and they'll pay pay it back to you and that's where the happiness come comes from mm. and and w- w- with this kind of you know this attitude or this this um, approach to to work to business how how have you found your uh, your approach how have you found it's been responded to in the corporate world um I think it, <clears throat> for me it works pretty well. Um, and you, you des- described me as did you say authentic? Uh, yeah, genuine? yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's at least an objective. Um, not, not always achieve it, but I, I really work hard to to be in that state. You know, to mm. not put on a show, a face, or integrity is a key word for me. You know that. What I think, say, and do that needs to be in harmony. If it, if it's not, um, I have 
yeah, yeah, cognitive dissonances that that make me unhappy, un uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. so it's very very relevant for me, uh, even excessive sometimes. My wife complains when I'm searching for coherence in what other people say or in what happens in the world and it doesn't really matter and not everything is coherent but that's i, I have this drive you know and yeah, i think that allows me also to be um yeah quite authentic and and, and genuine mm. and i think what it it helps me moving me moving in in organizations um, be in a, uh, a company or sort of, sort of association, French groups of friends is, I think it creates trust. Um, people tend to trust me fairly quickly. Uh, and based on that trust, um, I think um, I'm not bad at building relationships with, with people, uh, mm. genuine relationships, so that they, that they understand that I'm, that I, Shares the relationship that I have a sincere interest for the person, and it's not a transactional approach, no. Because many people try to build relationships, but they have something very specific in mind that they want to get out of that relationship, no. And I, I don't always manage to, but um, I try to be yeah, myself. Try to explore what happened in front of them, really have a genuine interest for the uh, for the person, and so that. Uh, the least that I gain is a, a a genuine healthy relationship with that person. Uh, it can be more intense or or, or less, you no. Know? And then, on top, once we have that, um, get from that person what is an interest for me, and provide to that person what is of interest to that person is kind of the the the, the second step. Um, yeah. So I, I know so, you, you spent a lot of time working in in um, human ops. Uh, HR people dealing with, with people. Tell us a bit about your experience in in that uh, arena. I came to that arena um, from an kind of an unsuspected uh, space. I've never, I've never, I've never worked in uh, HR until what is that now? Not, not ten years ago. But then, for a period of about seven years, I had uh, the role of the chief people officer of a mid-sized company. And I think I entered that organization when there were maybe 80 and 100 people and I left it when we were 450, I, I, I believe. And I have consulted with that organization um, more on, on the on the strategy topics and uh, operating systems. So I was a consultant to the, to the management team. The CEO was a good friend of mine and um, I helped them organize management meetings, facilitate meetings, and some certain planning procedures. And, uh, and then we started working on culture. And, and one night, this this friend, uh, having beers late in the night, he, he invited me, asked me if I <clears throat> wanted to come come over to the to the other side, you not know, become really part of the part of the team. And, and I accepted that with the condition that it would be half um, just half of my time. So as a, a part time chief chief people officer for I think it was six, six or seven, six or seven years. Mm -hmm. And I, I do have to say that be, the years before that, I already had developed quite a, a, a deep interest in everything related to the people function and, and, and culture, particularly in, in the world of startups and, and scale-ups. Um, I, had, I had been an entrepreneur myself. I was on the investor side for, for startups um, and a CEO of um, a scale up for a, a couple of years, and uh, that was the of all the things you do in a company. That was the area that was corresponded most to my interest and my my my, my callings. So I had a little bit of theoretical knowledge, um, and the way I uh, I approached it, the, the interesting thing was that I found a there was somebody leading that function when I came in, um, but that person was basically busy just keeping the balls in the air of a fast growing company from an administrative perspective. And, um, and that person had never had the, the time, um, maybe also not the kind of the perspective and the, the education to lead that function from a more strategic perspective. Okay. I came in, uh, didn't really have to do any of the, the operation. I was responsible for the operational, the administrative part, but I didn't really have to do it. No, that was 
an ongoing operation and, and well 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 uh, established. So what I did for most of those six seven years was really to um, continuously in, invent new processes um, to make the the company more attractive, especially to to candidates because it's a it's in the healthcare business and we had of the four hundred fifty people, three hundred were doctors. So our biggest challenge was to acquire doctors. So employer branding, making this company attractive to uh, highly specialized to get talent was one of my main main focus and so my, most of my time was really was um, defining culture articulating culture institutionalizing culture and then the, the corresponding hr practices and that institutionalized and reinforced those uh, those, those those cultural elements to in the end make it attractive for people who wanted to join us and also for the people already with us not so retention and and, and attraction. I think what helped me a great well, deal. Seven and I, years, I said, sorry. Seven years. Yeah, seven years, yeah, yeah, yeah. And what was really interesting is um, my role in the senior leadership team. Um, uh, usually the, the HR person is, the weight of the HR person and the leadership team tend, traditionally tends, if they have a seat at all, um, uh, then it tends to be, um, let's call it a lightweight, you know, yeah. uh, they're usually not people who have a lot of say, a lot of credibility when it comes to business and, and strategy, you know, they're, they're, people recur to them when it comes to really very specific people topics, but they, they don't they don't tend to have a lot of influence on the business as such and, and, and the strategy. And since I didn't come from the people side, uh, rather the opposite, I've been a CEO myself and I've been an entrepreneur myself. Um, so I had a lot to to say and to contribute also on the on the strategic side, and it allowed me to really focus the work that we do on the people side in a way that it's helpful for the company mm. in a strategic uh, from a strategic perspective. You know, so mm. okay. that that helped me to get most out of this this, this function. You know, yeah. a lot of companies. Companies who don't play it from a strategic perspective, their main objective is to, to make people happy, um, and that's fine. And, and it's definitely it's, it's better than not making people happy. But if you can do it in a way that also is really pays into your strategic objectives, you know that you achieve that people behave in a way that your your stakeholders most for, for most um, your customers appreciate then the HR function becomes really strategic. Mm. So, Sebastian, on a scale of 1 to 10, how do you rate your negotiation skills? Um, I don't know. I've never thought about it. But um, in terms of uh, knowledge, uh, very limited. <laughs> so anything that I that I achieve is, is more intuition than... The conscious application of any skills I I, sh I should have, um, so maybe a five <laughs> somewhere somewhere there. And and how many times a day do you think you negotiate? Um, many times, um, getting my kids out of bed, <laughs> <laughs> negotiating what's for what's for breakfast, <laughs> negotiating weekend plans with my wife. Um, uh, just the private side, no. And then mm -hmm. once I open my computer, mm -hmm. there's probably a little negotiation behind most of most of every email I mm -hmm. I read and 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 answer in mm -hmm. that sense. So when, when you look at yourself personally, and then you look at the experience that you've had in work working in talent and people and and what you're doing now, um, how important do you think it is that that, that people look to improve, work upon, build upon their, their negotiation skills? I think it's it's highly, highly relevant. Um, maybe a, a different word, it's probably in there, um, is you want to be in, influential, no? If you, you have your object objectives or you defend, you create and define and defend the objectives of 
of your organization. It can be a department, it can be an entire an, an entire company. You know, then you you need to be influential in in convincing other people to buy into your vision and build, contribute what you think is needed. You no, know, to to bring that vision vision alive you know uh, it can be the vision of the family it can be the vision of what you want your kids to be or it can be the vision for this organization uh, should be uh, why, why is it a struggle with this I, I you know you, you you kind of even as you're you're explaining it now it's like you know, negotiation my relationship with that word i give it a five out of ten and even though it's something i do every day and what, what is it do you think that makes people feel uncomfortable around the word negotiation? Hmm. It probably suggests a certain transactionality, you know, that um, you, it probably implies that it's something that has a, a beginning and an end. Hmm. And whereas in real life, it's a conversation embedded in a, Two people or two organizations building, having, hopefully maintaining a a, a relationship. You no, know? um, so probably the way I when, I when I answered your question, the way I look at it was that this is in the, the, the conversations where we haggle or over certain certain outcomes, but they're embedded in. Uh, in the rest of in, in, in the rest of life, you no. Know? And if we only look at this moment, um, that it might feel quite transactional. Um, yeah. But if you look at it from a wide, wide, wider perspective, this is just one conversation and many that constitute a longer, yeah. long, long, longer relationships, you no. Know? And from so, yeah, maybe it it might just be a loaded expression you now that we associate with that particular moment of trying to come to a very specific outcome so just to to finish off uh you you had an idea a few years ago that you just you, you saw these people these companies and ceos running their companies and, and it seemed that they were kind of spinning the hamster wheel chasing a number profits and so on and and you identified that actually there was another way to look at business, not just looking at profits, not just looking at making money. There was a way that as human beings, we could also develop ourselves and grow ourselves as well as growing the business. In fact, if we focused on growing ourselves, the natural consequence of that is growing the business. And that idea came to fruition with, with the School of Founders. And, and I want to congratulate you on uh, the, the graduation of the first cohort. But I'd like you to, I'd like to give you the opportunity to just tell us how it felt from having that idea, which was just an idea that may or may not happen, to seeing the reality, the ups and the downs, because I know you had a lot of ups and downs, literally, I remember asking you, how do you feel? And you said, it's up and down minute by minute. And then mm -hmm. in, in the graduation, which took place last Saturday, just give us a brief synopsis of, of how you reflect on that. Mm. I'm, I'm myself surprised by the outcome, I, I have to <laughs> I have to say. The, the original calling um, from people at Yes and No invited me to contribute to that was um, well, we defined it together a, a let's, let's call it quite a conventional education program that helps companies scale uh, as fast as possible as, as, as it makes makes sense you know? um, but then I had my my particular let's say philosophical ideological uh, background no which um, I call conscious capitalism so I I defend that uh, companies don't exist they shouldn't exist to make lots of money for the owners um, they need they need to have a, a social function they, they need to serve others other stakeholders um, 
many different stakeholders. Um, and, uh, ideally, they define a, a specific purpose, and in the pursuit of that purpose, they make sure that all the stakeholders that are needed to run this company somehow win in in this in this pursuit. You know? uh, so this, this is my my conviction. I apply it to startups and scale up as much as to big companies. That's um, every company should work like that, and and hopefully one day that will be my vision will be completed when we wouldn't have to call it conscious capitalism anymore because conscious uh, capitalism will be conscious and you don't need the the the, the adjective you know? and then within conscious capitalism you won't ever have a conscious company without a conscious leader you know so if you want that path of transformation for the for the organization um, that requires a path of transformation for the leaders and, and we all have unlimited potential no it's uh, it's not that i haven't met anybody who's arrived <laughs> at complete con conscious consciousness um, and and then when we started to build this this program we were more thinking of um, finance and marketing and and, and, and strategy um, but at the same time i had the liberty and also the my my conviction came kind of kind of through to introduce these more conscious elements into the curriculum. And that was very easy in, in the leadership part. Um, and the world is going there. I, I think there are different ways of teaching leadership. Uh, let's, let's call it con conscious leadership. My, my understanding is uh, becoming more and more um, normal because people also realize that it that, that, that it works. Um, so I have the liberty to design together with you and uh, our dear dear colleagues you know, in interventions um, with our dear dear participants uh, you know, that corresponds to the idea of a more conscious uh, type of, of leadership. And then on other occasions, as you witnessed, we um, we had other people who came to us who spoke about purpose, about uh, stakeholder uh, in integration, uh, about more conscious cultures and how you, how you treat your, your, your employees. And so in the process, um, this, this whole project uh, became more and more conscious in my language. Um, to the degree that when we had this conversation uh, that, that um, graduation on, on, on Saturday that I was surprised by um, the sometimes from my view uh, limited input we gave in that sense uh, how big of an effect that uh, had on, on on our participants and that, that uh, at the end and um, when they look back at that year year with us and um, that what they was more impactful on on them no? from the many things we we, we did with them and, and that was highly highly yeah highly satisfying to 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 see that and um, i'm happy it turned out this way and this whole interview chat podcast whatever we want to call it is is around the idea of emotionally intelligent negotiation and and, and this is um using our raw talents of emotional intelligence which is our ability to connect with the other person with our ability to also check ourselves understand where we are and what emotions we're, we're feeling and what part they're playing in our real-time reactions in order to have some kind of influence on the outcome when we talk about emotional inter emotionally intelligent negotiation how important do you see that today in the workplace Extremely. I was just thinking, has it always been? Um, I think, yeah, it probably has always been. We didn't, we just didn't realize the the importance, and we were embedded in an organization that had mm. followed still different different rules. No, in a, a very hierarchical organization, where somebody calls the shot, and the rest uh, obeys. There's less to negotiate. No, today. Uh, as we discussed earlier, um, workers, us, we have different expectations. Now we want to realize ourselves and have more autonomy. And so um, I think it, 
it's it, it in, increased and is 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 highly important. Um, I think the more mistakes are getting make uh, get, getting made uh, because if people have a um, certain emotion, then uh, because they uh, misinterpret a certain fact, no, it's just a, a emotion that play tricks tricks on us and to understand the other the other side um, and yourself no the self awareness what are your emotions doing with you in every every moment it's 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 it's, it's yeah. highly, highly highly relevant um, i had a conversation with somebody just yesterday actually we were talking about the same subject and and he kept saying well yeah you know i don't want people to get emotional in, in when it comes to negotiations they just get emotional and you know what we try and do is just deal with the raw facts so that you know, we kind of stop people from bringing their emotions into it. And, and and I said, well, actually, the only thing that wouldn't feel an emotion in a negotiation is the table you're sat around. But we as human beings, we're emotional anyway, and we have way over 200 different emotions. So when you say, don't get emotional, I, I, I struggle with, with that. I, I think we have, we've taken this term emotions, and we've linked it to weakness negative vulnerable kind of emotions whilst forgetting that um being happy i can be happy and angry at the same time i can be confused and have clarity about my confusion i mean the emotions that we feel are so intertwined and so confusing that people just bundle them in one one bucket and call them emotions and keep them out whereas i see them as data points of information and i think you know, if we bring those back into the the main stage of our conversations and become aware of them ourselves and become aware of them in other people um, and make them part of the general conversation, uh, I think, as you said, you know, those common mistakes that are made because we let our emotions run wild with us, uh, I think we, we can we can avoid them. And also those really difficult conversations, you know, you've got, a, a, imagine you have a performance review. And you've rated yourself really highly and somebody else has rated themselves very low. And now HR has to get together and talk with a member of their team that has rated themselves highly, but actually the consensus is they're low. There's going to be already emotions involved in that. I mean, when you were involved in in, uh, in HR, how did you deal with performance reviews? We didn't. We, we didn't have... Uh, performance reviews. We, oh wow! There was one when I came into the university. There was the the typical annual review. We in January, February, you sit down with your boss and then agree some objectives <laughs> and give each other feedback. Uh, but we we did away with that and we substituted it for a a um, we call it a coaching system. Uh, it was a a sequence, a cadence of conversations, one-on-one -on -one conversations that the, the manager with the direct, we call it support, by the way, not report, the, the direct support, because me as a manager, I'm here to support mm -hmm. people that are in my team, mm -hmm. so my direct um, support. And we had um, at least a bi-weekly one-on-one. -on -one. And then the agenda and the topic to cover in that one-on-one uh, -on -one, uh, changed over the course of of the year we had a, a ca calendar mapped out uh, to, to cover feedback to cover career development to cover compensation uh, to cover day to day to cover uh, what we call line of sight line of sight conversation so that um, it's my role in that conversation to explain what's going on in the in the wider realm of the of the company, what is the strategy, what are the plans, so that person knows how their work contributes to the wider goals. Okay. You know, how they how they evolve. A whole set of <clears throat> conversations that's supposed to have, and that was our performance management system. We didn't have grades, we didn't have ratings. And Interesting. Didn't have that. And was that something you introduced? Yes. Actually we invented that. Wow! Uh, yeah, I was inspired by um, the first thing I I introduced and implemented in that company. Something I didn't invent was a I think I called that earlier a management management system an operating system. No? So the 
the, the frequency, the cadence, and the type of conversation that the management, the senior leadership team uh, has, no? a weekly, a monthly, a quarterly, a yearly offsite, and, and so on. No? In each of these um, of these each of these meetings, they had a, a very particular purpose and a very particular agenda. How they were built and uh, people attended. You no, know, the, um, so there was a there was a system, and I thought, why not create a system um, uh, for the conversation that a, a manager should have with their with with their, their people? And wow. that was the the outcome. Excellent. Mm -hmm. And that wraps up our enlightening conversation with Sebastian Ross, the director of the groundbreaking School of Founders program at ESA Business School. Thank you, Sebastian, for sharing your valuable insights with us. And to our listeners, if you found this episode as inspiring as I did, make sure you subscribe to Empathy at the Table on your favorite podcast platform and stay connected for some more empowering discussions.